Imagine knowing exactly what your students are learning and exactly which steps you need to take next. Join us in Download the Reading Quiz to craft meaningful and productive formative assessments that move away from gotcha moments of basic recall and toward assessing what your students actually can do. In this 30-minute free masterclass, we'll share three powerful assessment keys that work for any novel at any time of the year. Head to shop.bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass to sign up, and we'll also send you a free workbook to keep track of all your notes. Once again, that's shop.bravenewteaching.com slash masterclass to nail formative assessments forever. Hey there, Brave New Teaching community. Before we get into this episode today, Amanda and I wanted to make a quick little statement because we made a slip up in episode 156 of the podcast where we were debriefing Amanda's interview with author Shamile Mendez. We were talking about different ideas for units and lessons, and we were talking about using the film Juno as a supplement for a possible unit that we were brainstorming. And we accidentally dead named the main actor, Elliot Page in Juno. And so we wanted to stop what we were doing, make sure that we addressed it, make sure that we apologize for anyone who was offended, felt harm by us, by our negligence. Really, it was an oversight and we need to pay better attention. And we wanted to make sure that we did that as soon as possible. We will also be editing the footage so that it is corrected and all set. And we just want to once again apologize for the oversight. It is kind of the nature of our very conversational style of podcasting is sometimes we kind of get talking and uh, we miss things and we apologize for doing that. And we are going to continue to learn, know better, do better moving forward on the podcast as always. And We, again, hope that if anyone wants to reach out and speak to us specifically about the issue, you know our inbox is always open, bravenewteaching at gmail.com. Absolutely. And we want to say thank you to our listeners who alerted us to our mistake so that we could get on it and do right as best we could, as quickly as we could. All right, everybody, let's get into the show. Well, hello and welcome back to Brave New Teaching and welcome back to Camp BNT. Hi, Amanda. Hey, everybody. So friends who are listening in real time, we are knee deep in our summer series called Camp Brave New Teaching. Camp BNT, if you're in the know, you know (laughs) what I'm saying. And this series is a summer series of author interviews that Amanda and I have embarked upon. Um, And we just kind of figured, I mean, we've got a whole episode on it, so we'll link it in the show notes. But basically, Camp BNT is the summer camp that we nerdy English teachers always wanted. And maybe we didn't even know we wanted, but here it is. Let's read books. Let's talk about them. And then one up you, Amanda. Are you ready? Ready. Let's talk to the people who wrote the books. Like how It's still so surreal to me that we're doing this. Stinking cool, man. We love it. So today's interview is with Diana Lopez, who is a middle grades author. And we know that many of you here listening in the Brave New Teaching community are middle grades teachers. And so we wanted to make sure that in this series of interviews, we included some voices of authors who are writing specifically for those sixth, seventh, eighth grade, you know, even upper elementary through, I mean, some high school, right? But really intended sure. for middle grades. And Amanda and I, we we are very like open with admitting that like this is not our strong suit. We we've not taught in middle grade classrooms. I've taught like transitional kindergarten through fifth, and then nine through twelve is where I spent most of my time. And Amanda's been in nine through twelve, and so. Middle grade yeah. kind of baffles us sometimes. I actively, I actively avoid middle grade. Hundred percent, same. Um, until I talked to Abby, and uh, my conversation with Abby on the interview when we talked about independent reading and like, yes, kind you of, are right. I know her experience shifting over to middle. She's given me some great recommendations, but still, this just speaks to how amazing Diana Lopez is and the book that we both got to read before the interview. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yes, we got to talk to Diana Lopez specifically about her newest book, Felice and the Wailing Woman, which is a retelling of the folktale La Llorona. But like, we talked about so much more. And like, 
Yeah. She, well, she's an educator herself. So here, I'm going to read her little like bio from her book itself. And Amanda's going to tell you a little bit more about our conversation before we just dive in because you're ready. She you're has here. lived so many lives within her life. And it's so cool. So Diana Lopez is the author of the adult novella, Sophia's Saints, and numerous middle grade novels, including Confetti Girl, Nothing Up My Sleeve, and Lucky Luna. Her debut picture book, Sing With Me, The Story of Selena Quintanilla, is available in English and Spanish. She also wrote, and this is what I thought was really cool. Well, amongst other things, <laughs> the novel adaptation for the Disney Pixar film, Coco which we love in this house. I'm oh, sure yes. your kids love it oh, too because yes. it's so cute. So Diana retired after a 28-year career in education at both middle grade and college levels. I believe she told us that she was a middle school ELA teacher in the classroom for 10 years, right? And then she moved on to college level. Mm -hmm. um, and she still enjoys meeting with students when she visits schools to chat about books and writing. And we talk about that in the interview. When we started talking about her classroom visits, she just light, she lit up. She was like, <laughs> I love talking to students. And I was like, dude, we get it. She lives in her hometown of Corpus Christi, which is where in Texas, where her, well, this specific book takes place just outside of Corpus Christi, but the main character grows up in Corpus Christi and she is amazing. She is amazing. And she was, <laughs> she was new to us. So we were really excited to get connected with her. And if you've listened to this series, you've listened to some of our other authors, it's a little bit on purpose, but a little bit serendipitous that we keep, you know, reaching out and, and connecting with authors who are former teachers or who get teachers yes. or who yes. are like on this. Well, it, it's not really that surprising, but are on this mission that we're on, which is to, get books in the hands of kids that are going to provide them new experiences that they may not have already had and to get them out of the worksheet, textbook, whatever kind of nonsense it is either being forced or is the only thing available. We want to make new things available to you um, without expecting you to find all the time in your day to do it. So yes, we know what it is to be teachers and not be able to like go out and Find the and sometimes you know you're looking at us on Instagram or some of our friends and you're like oh so and so recommends this book and I have taken the leap before and just brought a book into my classroom and gone I should have I should have read that first and I'm saying definitely read things first but at least something like this interview gives you a deeper look into figuring out what will and maybe won't work in your classroom and like having more. I feel like more information is always better before getting into like then taking the time to read something before you bring it into your classroom. You know what I mean? Like this gives you a little bit more yes. of a leg up of what to expect. And I don't know, having like the energy of the author's voice in yes. your back pocket is a whole other kind of like level of confidence in teaching. Like I feel like after we talked with uh, Ruta Sepetis, I feel like walking in to teach one of her novels, I would feel so confident. Like, oh, yeah. I know, right. I know her agenda. I know what's her deal, which I think is really empowering. And that's what we wanted to, to share with you. So um, let me give you a quick, like, what to expect in the interview, what the yeah. book is about very briefly, because when we end the interview, we're done. So as another, just kind of quick heads up, I'm going to give you, like I said, an overview, but Marie and I are doing these interviews in tandem with our own episode that will be a full debrief. So if you're like, okay, that was helpful, but what next? Just tune in next week yeah. and Marie and I will have a full rundown of kind of our takeaways and how we see this being in the classroom. So we don't mention that at the end. So I want to make sure you heard that now. Also for camp, we want you to join us and like be part of our Facebook group where we're having extended discussions about these books. Uh, the way that you join us there is www.bravenewteaching.com slash camp. Um, and you can get there in our show notes as well. So without yep. further ado, this conversation is about, like Marie said, it's a retelling of the folk tale about La Llorona, a monster, right, who is uh, been known to haunt the rivers around the border between Mexico and Texas, um, and other, I guess, other border states too, the, the legend kind of sp is sprawling. Um, and the legend retold from the point of view of a young middle grade aged girl. I don't think that she named her. her. She's 12. She yes. is 12. Okay. She's okay. almost, she's on the cusp of 13. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So she's right there at that age and she's 
actually the daughter of La Llorona. One of her daughters survived this legendary right, drowning. Yep. Um, and so she is on a quest to reunite with her mother when she finds out that that's who she is and to really kind of see the other side of this supposed monster. So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, uh, this checks a lot of boxes. Yeah, it does. Yep, that's why it's here. And in this interview, you're going to hear even more about all of those boxes that this book checks off. So, And there, she's so going cool. to talk about free teacher guides because, yes. yes, her we and it'll be linked in the show notes, but her website is full of them. And I cannot wait to link those in the Camp BNT Facebook group and really get like digging in. Yes. Next week's debrief, like Amanda said, we're going to dig into some of that and just talk about how to incorporate like high quality materials that are out there for free and give it the little BNT unit makeover curriculum rehab, all of our jargon twist friends. Enjoy today's interview. Save all of your questions on your notes app, jot them down on a piece of paper, make yourself a voice memo, join us in camp BNT, ask all of the questions. We'll see you here again next week. Uh, There's an extended episode for brave new teaching happy hour. We're all over the place and it's in such a good way. So it is. With no further ado, cue the music. You're listening to Brave New Teaching, and we are so much more than a podcast. We give teachers the inspiration, support, and tools to challenge the status quo. I'm Amanda, and I'm a former English teacher from Illinois. And I'm Marie, and I'm a teacher from Southern California. Join us at bravenewteaching.com to find out more about our courses, festivals, and get every episode's show notes. We're so glad you're here. Enjoy the show. Okay, so Brave New Teacher community, we are so excited to welcome author Diana Lopez to the podcast. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yay! So Hi, we, oh yes, hey everyone. Amanda's Sorry, perfect. I'm like just ready to jump in, and Amanda's also here. Oh, hey, Amanda. <laughs> Diana, before we jump into our questions, would you give us your little like elevator pitch? Just tell us a little bit about yourself and essentially what brings you to this conversation today. Well, I'm Diana Lopez. I was born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas. It's a coastal town here and kind of known as the birth of Whataburger. I don't know if everybody knows what Whataburger is, but that is like our big hamburger fast food joint. (laughs) But I also, I'm a retired teacher. I retired three years ago, taught for 10 years at the middle school level in San Antonio. And then the rest of the time I spent uh, at the college level. And so put in 28 years, they were great years I was ready to retire and kind of uh, spend more, a little more time focusing on my writing. And I'm still very involved in education in the sense that I do a lot of school visits. You know, I've done some mentoring and, and things like that. <laughs> So oh, cool. love it. Oh my gosh. Okay. Th- okay. I want to stop for a second and talk about burgers. So <laughs> what are they called? It's- well, okay. So it's, it's Whataburger. You've never heard of Whataburger? It- no? What Amanda? Like, Come on! What a burger! Okay. But when I was growing up, I thought they were water burgers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounded like, and I never understood what a water burger was because there's no water in it. But anyway, oh I thought, well, because we're by the water. <laughs> oh, That's funny. Really, it's like probably the most popular like burger fast food chain in Texas. And I was born in Corpus Christi and, and, and Whataburger outnumbers McDonald's and everything else around here. <laughs> what, what makes it so special? This is important to the, the listeners, the educators of the, this community. This has oh, a lot yeah. to do with English language arts. Yes. It has a lot to do with English language arts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, we use like the Whataburger, the classic Whataburger just uses mustard. It doesn't use those special sauces or ketchup. Mm-hmm. Like we kind of freak out at the idea of mayonnaise and ketchup on a burger kind of freaks us out. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but yeah, they, and they have nice toasty buns. <laughs> So, okay, this might be a really good for the future. We should ask more people about their burger situation. I just yeah. got, we have a friend of the podcast in Ohio and I was just down oh, there yeah. doing some professional development and I was in Dayton and she took me to the hamburger trolley. There is a little trolley in downtown Dayton and they do like miniature burgers. I swear it wasn't even a slide. It was smaller than a slider, but they're deep fried, oh. like, which sounds horrifying 
was a little, I was a little bit horrified, but they, it was a deep fried mini patty on a toasted bun, salt, pepper, pickle, onion, no sauce. <laughs> it was delicious. I mean, I, I felt full the entire day. I had three and I don't know. It was just interesting. And then I know I've had in and out over in California. Uh-huh. This is, yeah. Chicago's definitely got some claim to fame, like the char grilled, but I don't know. I can really kind of care less about burgers, but I think that's interesting. You brought that up, Diana. <laughs> that's really funny. But I was very curious about that. <laughs> Well, so your experience in the classroom, that was English language arts, correct? Yes. In, mm-hmm. Yeah, in the middle of it. So did you ever do uh, one of our favorite classroom practices called First Chapter Friday? Had that like made it to the, the sphere when you were still in the classroom? We, I never call it First Chapter Friday, but um, especially when I taught at the middle school, I love to do read alouds yes. in, in the classroom and just as a way of getting the students engaged with the book. And I think the best way to do that is just read the first few pages so they can hear the voice of the character and so they can get drawn into the story. Because I think if you just give them the book and ask them to read, mm, they might or might not. But they, you know, and I taught sixth grade for a while and then I taught eighth grade. And the eighth graders acted like they were too old for the <laughs> read alouds. But the truth is, they really enjoyed it, you know, and they would follow along in the book. And it was a great way of getting them interested in the story so that they could continue to read on their own. Amanda, this, uh, is, your, this is your favorite question. So why don't you go ahead then with the This app. is it. Yeah. Would, you, would you do it for us? Would you do a little? I would um, love to. <laughs> the first few pages, I, I would, would do really like this, the first couple of pages of my newest yeah. book, my Los Woo! Monstros Feliz and the Wailing Woman. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who don't have a copy yet, we will link all of this stuff in the show notes for you. So don't worry about that. We're going to let Diana read for you, but definitely make sure you head to the show notes to get a copy of the book for yourself. And I want to do a shout out to Pablo Leon. He's the one who did the cover of the book. And I, I just love the cover. You know, you, you, uh, I'm not an, I'm not an artist in this way. And so I really admire artists that can, you know, look at a book and capture the spirit of the book. And I think he did such a great job. <laughs> it is lovely. I like it too. It's really like eye catching and then pretty. And then my, my son who is almost 10 was like, what you, what it, mom, what are you reading? And I was like, you can have it when I'm done. He's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yes. He did such a good, the colors are bold and everything. No, it's well, great. When you go back to the details too, like every time like you catch a new detail in the story, like he, he got so many of them in the cover art. He did. He really did. I mean, it's amazing. He's got the picture of the Tres Leches cake mm-hmm. and a, <laughs> a chimera. I mean, he's got it. <laughs> so here's oh, my yeah. first, like, maybe page and a half of the book. Beautiful. Today, the students of Tres Leches Middle School in Tejas would rather eat dirt than go on a field trip. This field trip, to be exact. They'd rather stay inside and take pop quizzes. They'd rather eat raw broccoli for lunch and do 1,153 jumping jacks for P.E. Instead, they move slowly, double knotting their shoelaces and topping off their water bottles as Mr. Tercero hurries them along. Andale, he says. They've heard of other schools in other towns with field trips to museums or firehouses or historic sites like the Alamo. They've heard that instead of hiking to their destinations, the students travel by bus. They've even heard, and this one's hard to believe, that field trips often include tour guides who know everything and then some, and gift shops. Yes, gift shops where visitors can buy postcards or refrigerator magnets or tiny spoons. But for the pobrecitos of Tres Leches, There were no buses, tour guides, or gift shops. They went to only three places, and they went to these places every year. El Camarón Dance Hall and Arcade, the Mud Expanse, and La Llorona Park. The park part was always said tongue-in-cheek, and if anyone knew what the opposite of a park was, they would have used that word instead. Come on, let's go, Miss Peters calls out. And so the students start their trek, not bothering to look around or make jokes. They pass the playground and the library and the vacant lot. They march right out of town 
to a clearing of mostly dead grass. They gulp warm water from their bottles and swat at mosquitoes, the humid air thick around them, until finally arriving at a wooden marker, like a tombstone, nearly hidden by webs and vines. Stop, Mr. Tercero demands. The students freeze, not daring to go farther. The teachers pull out head shears and pruners, and they start cutting away, little by little, revealing a sign. Beware the river. For here haunts La Llorona. In life, she was a fool for love. Then she drowned her children out of spite. And now her ghost wants to drown you, too. (laughs) That would be uh, flying off the shelf. Oh, even in (laughs) in a high school classroom, too, because the kids would be like, oh, I could read that in like a day. And they would just like (laughs) gobble it up. Yes. I love the place where you stopped. Okay, so we're going to get into more of the story inside the interview a little bit deeper. But I think this will be a great chance for us to start kind of further back in your journey, Diana. I think teachers and students alike, I know teachers are always... I think we a lot of times find ourselves on the reading side, focusing so hard on sharing stories with students. But I think these interviews that we do with with authors, we also love taking a peek behind the curtain um, Mm -hmm. and hearing a little bit more about your own writing journey. So, you know, where did that writing journey begin for you and what, what makes it keep going for you? Well, you know, to be really honest, my writing journey began probably when I was in middle school. I've always loved books, always, always been fascinated by just words, you know, but when I was in middle school, you know, I'd I'd come home from school and, and, um, I had, uh, my siblings, I had a cousin that lived nearby that was always at the house, the neighborhood kids. I, you know, I had a great mom who was the kind of mom who had little treats for us after school. (laughs) So everybody would (laughs) congregate at our house. And so, you know, it was always like, how was your day was the question. And I'd start to answer and always get, interrupted. I was never (laughs) able to finish telling how my day was. And it would bother me that I would be interrupted. And I just didn't get to finish like this story of my day. And so I, that's, that's really why I started writing in a journal and it was more of a diary, like, you know, put the date and it was just a, a plain spiral notebook. It wasn't anything fancy. And then it would give me a chance to finish my, you know, whatever story I had started, but as time moved on, Uh, I started to ask what if questions when I was writing in my journal, you know, instead of writing what happened, I might write what I wished had happened. Or I would say, what if, you know, this happened instead, you know, and, and in a sense, I wasn't exactly writing stories, but I was writing little scenes that were from my imagination. And that's really how I got into writing fiction and my love for books continued. Uh, and um, later in life, uh, I already had my, I, I started teaching, <laughs> teaching at a middle school. And I remember my first month, uh, my teach, my principal called me into his office and he, he said, Mrs. Lopez, I really want to encourage you to get a master's degree. I like to encourage all the teachers to get master's degrees. It doesn't matter what you study, study something you enjoy. Wow. Um, you just want you to get a master's degree, you know, you'll get an automatic raise. And <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good you principle. Know? Yeah. Yeah. And so he was really encouraging that way. And so I started looking into it. And at the time, there were some masters of fine arts and creative writing programs. You know, there's a whole lot of them now. There weren't as many back then, but they were, it was kind of a new thing, even mm-hmm. though there's a program in Iowa that's been around forever, but other colleges started picking it up as a degree choice. And so I got my master's while I was teaching middle school, you know, in creative writing. And really my first book, my very, very first book is a book called Sophia Saints. that was published 20 years ago, you wow. know, and it's my master's thesis. <laughs> so yeah. I wrote it in college <laughs> and I've been writing ever since. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So cool. I feel like, I'm sure, too, that some of our teachers listening, especially if they are newer to the field, are going, how did you do anything while teaching, nonetheless, get an MFA? But it goes to show, right, when you find the thing that lights you up, you can find the time and energy, even while doing something like teaching that's so all-consuming, you can still have those parts of your life. But I'm sure it took a lot of, like, 
very conscientious yeah. balance, right? <laughs> like or like purposeful balancing. I didn't have a lot of social time, you know. Sure, yeah, but something's got to give. And I would, I mean, we didn't have. I think it might be a little easier now because there's distance learning. Sure. But this was in the '90s, and we didn't, there were no distance learning options for me. And mm-hmm. I was living in San Antonio, and I was going to school in San Marcos, which is about an hour away. I was at Texas State, but I will say, you know, I would teach and I would get out of a school about 4.30 and my classes would start at 6.30 at night. So I would do this drive and I was going, I was going to another town and it was a literal and also a figurative transition moment for me, you know, and I, I would drive in silence and just kind of like get myself excited about the class. And I would go to class and, you know, and there were days where I was so tired and I said, what are you doing? You're crazy. Why are you doing this? But I would get to class and I would be there in, with a group of people that were just as excited about books and writing as I was. And it was for me a sanctuary, a joy, uh, an indulgence to go to school. And I, I, maybe that's what my principal my, was trying to tell me, <laughs> but, you know, find something you love because you'll finish it because you yeah. love it much. Oh, that's so <laughs> After cool. teaching for a while, it, it is a luxury to be a student again. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. yeah. To let someone else do the puppeteering <laughs> and just to be the puppet and be like, okay, like, I'm just going to do what I'm told. Like, it's kind of nice to do that after being in charge of everything. Right. Um, it, is, it is an indulgence. It's kind of novel, mm-hmm. right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, so further into your journey into writing, what was your inspiration for doing a modern retelling of like folk tales, especially for this middle grade? I mean, YA, but it's, but the younger side of it, the middle grade audience. You know, I think children are really drawn to folk tales, myths, legends, our favorite stories as kids. I mean, we just love that stuff. True. And as a child, I heard these stories, you know, from my family members, you know, and, but they were always presented, these characters like La Llorona were always presented very monstrous, you know. And so I, when I write for young people, I have a very hopeful view of the world because I think that's what I want to leave them with. Like I want young people to read my books and to feel hopeful and happy and funny, but I love to take scary things or frightening, sad, really almost crisis moments and bring them to light, but in a way that also adds some humor. So that's why these stories never had that side to them. They were just always like these, you know, kind of dark. If you think about the legends and folk tales, a lot of them are really dark And I wanted to kind of like shine a light and show the other side, you know, and and just kind of explore them from um, a perspective that brought in some of that hopeful tone and and humorous tone, you know, uh, in the writing. But this story in particular was one that I wanted to tackle because it is a very popular, probably the most popular legend of the Mexico-U.S. border, you know, and one that uh, does get treatment, you know, in the media. There was a movie a few years ago called mm-hmm. La Llorona that was very, very much, she was very much a monster. Very scary and movie. Yes. Very scary movie. I would not, yes. not show that to the kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that kind of, you know, it really is a monster film. But there have been some other middle grade and, and picture book versions of La Llorona, all of them have shown her as the monster. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to kind of like play with that idea and, and and reflect on her as, you know, somebody with some redeemable qualities, you know, I think the thing that stands out to me the most in just it's, well, it's an adorable story. And I know Amanda wants to ask you more about your protagonist about Felice, but like I loved just in the story overall, it's not just the darkness like you were talking about. It's not just the light and fuzzy unicorns. Like you're giving hope without shying away from the darkness. Like there's this beautiful mix of reality because that's (laughs) something that we've talked about on the podcast many times. Amanda and I are friends in real life. We both have little kids and we talk about like, Kids, students, children of all ages are not afraid of reality. They Absolutely. be they become wary of it because we as the grown-ups around them 
tiptoe around the dark stuff. Mm -hmm. And so showing them how to grapple with it through stories like this, I think is so important that, yeah, I just like, I really liked that. That stood out to me a lot in, and your voice shines through so brilliantly in your writing. (laughs) I really loved it. I, I think you're making some wonderful observations because yes, a lot of times parents and teachers we want to protect our children, but we're really not doing them a service if no. we deny that, you know, bad things happen sometimes, you know, right. sad things happen sometimes because I mean, n- none of us hopes that a child has to experience those things, but it's inevitable that some children will. And, uh, and if we just deny that they happen, then we are not giving them coping skills, you know? And so that's what I think. And, and I mean, as a teacher, unfortunately did have students that were dealing with some real, you yeah. know, real troubling situations. And so they're, they need books that address the darknesses that are around us. They need those so they can learn one, you know, vicariously through a character that's kind of learned to cope you know, but also so they don't feel so alone in their experience. (laughs) It's that catharsis. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. I think that was for me, the best part of, of this story. And I haven't read your others, but this one for me, that was, that was marking in my heart. Like I I'm exactly what Marie, Marie just said, looking at my own children, looking at the students that I've taught, they need it. They need that reality. And I think a lot of this comes from Felice and I do want to talk about her. I think she's such especially for a middle grade book. And I mean this with absolutely no shade, Diana, but I don't always have this kind of an expectation for complexity of a character in a middle grade read. It's just not really something that I find very often when I do venture into middle grade books. I thought she was complex. I thought she was hilarious. I thought she was real. And I just loved her inner monologue. So I'm, I would love to hear from you about, you know, the creation of her, you know, how she came to be. Um, how much of her do you see in yourself or the people around you? Did she come, where did she come from? And and this amazingly ferocious spirit and her empathy, where did that come from? You know, when I first imagined this story, it really was, what if one of La Llorona's children survived was the question that I was like, was my what if question that started mm-hmm. off my journey into this story. So it really did begin with who was the child? Who would the child of La Llorona be? And, you know, La Llorona means the wailing woman. And she's mm-hmm. kind of, you know, she's known as a, a ghost that haunts rivers and she's always crying. She's always crying. She's always crying. And I thought, well, maybe her child is always smiling. <laughs> she's always happy. You know, it's kind of like a contrast to, the mother figure. And so th- this is, you know, when you when characters, some characters are just born and you just see them. And then some characters, you know, you, you have to dig a little deeper for, they take a little bit more time to reveal themselves. So I had this question in my mind. I knew it was going to be a daughter because I wanted this to kind of be a mother daughter story. And I knew that she was going to have a, a pretty uplifting type of attitude towards things. Uh, but one day I was, I was at the store and there I saw a happy face emoji purse, <laughs> just oh, like the one yeah. in the cover. Uh-huh. And I bought it. I said, I'm going to buy this. Cause I think my character has this purse, you know, and I actually kept that purse on my desk, you know, as I was writing the book. And so there's that, but each one of us, you know, we have our shadow side. You know, and as I started to think about her story, she survived this drowning in a river. It seemed logical that to me, whether or not she remembers it, because she was very young when it happened, uh, but it seemed logical to me that she would have a fear of water. And here she is living in Corpus Christi, which is right by the water. You really can't get, you, you know, there's a river, there's the, there's the ocean, you know, it's really hard to get to Corpus without crossing water or seeing water. And she's surrounded by it and it just terrifies her. And so, um, you know, she wants to meet her mother. Where's her mother? Her mother's by a river. She's afraid, you know, and so it just, how do you deal with that? And I think that that, you know, when you have a character that, doesn't just have one part of their personality because none of us do Mm -hmm. has all these other things about their, she likes art, you know, 
but because she's afraid of water, she only does drawing. She doesn't do painting because <laughs> right. she doing water. You know? so she has that this- one part where she looks down and it's watercolors and she's like, well, yeah, I'm not going to yeah. use that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And so, you know, it's like she has limitations like all of us do. And so how are we going to function with that? But she's also a young girl. She's in middle school. That's the point where you're moving from being a child to your adult self. Your body's changing. Your ability to think about the world is changing. And she's having to do all of this without, uh, she's got a great source in her Uncle Clem, who's a you know great parenting figure, but he's still a man, you know? I, and I, I think it's sometimes hard for young girls, young women to really talk to men about, you know, even if they've got very supportive, loving men in their lives, they don't always, they don't, it's very hard for them to understand what it's like to be a young girl. <laughs> no, it, it yeah. is. It's yeah. This episode is brought to you by Curriculum Rehab by us, the team here at Brave New Teaching. It is the first and only teacher PD of its kind, a course to help teachers like you by guiding you through creating your own personal framework for curriculum. You make it work for you, your students, and your unique situation because nobody else knows what the kiddos in your classroom need the way that you do. Curriculum Rehab takes all of the resources available to you, all of the lessons, the assessments, the activities, all of the texts, everything that could possibly be there for you, and it helps you organize what you actually need in order to attain your teaching objectives. These are the strategies that Amanda and myself have used in our own classrooms, have developed over very long years of teaching and figuring things out, combined together to create this framework and these strategies that we can guide you through. This course will give you the tools you need for a complete curriculum overhaul or to start from scratch. Wherever you are on that continuum, it does it all for you and with you on your timeline. So start today, do a little bit more in a couple of months, and then pick it up next summer. It's Teacher PD the way it should be on your own time. Head to curriculumrehab.com slash course for more information, or just head to the show notes for this episode. We cannot wait to see you there. It's finally time to take control of what goes on in your own classroom and create the curriculum of your dreams. All right, let's get back into the show. That leads us into my next question, which is about the existence of windows and mirrors in the world Mm -hmm. for, especially like as educators, we see our students, our young readers interacting with the things that we present them with and that idea of windows and mirrors. And what is your thought on the importance of especially cultural mirrors and windows? I know we were talking about like the uncle being able to relate Mm -hmm. to a girl, but anything really, what kind of stories maybe did you connect with growing up that were windows into other lives or mirrors for you? And how did that impact you as you were growing up with your love of books and stories? I think that's a really important reason why books are so, you know, necessary. Uh, I like to tell kids, like, this is when I was born. This is where I was born. This is who I was born into being. And so like, I'm never going to know uh, what, you know, I wasn't born in the 1800s. Yeah. You know? So I'm not going to know like what that world experience was. I didn't grow up in Tokyo, you know, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up as a man or, you know, I mean, just like things that are not me, I didn't have that experience. But when you read a book, And when you write a book, but when you read a book for that moment in time, you are not yourself anymore. You enter into the perspective of somebody else. You time travel, you body jump, you know, through space and a good writer will make that world very tangible for you in your imagination. And so, you know, it, it is a way of getting to experience life beyond your life. And what a great gift, because we are, in a sense, trapped within our own selves and our own place and time. But through books, we can escape that for a while. And when you do that, you have a better understanding of the experiences of others and their perspectives. And they might be very different from you. But you might also see, and this is why I think the mirror image is a good one, even if you're reading something that was written 100, 200, 300 years ago, you can see yourself in it. 
And you can see that there are these things about human nature that pertain to all of us through time, you know, and when you have that understanding, it does make you a more empathetic person. It makes you, I think, a better person, you know, a less selfish person and a person who's uh, able to question things and, and to even fight for people that are different than them, you know, because you start to see how we're not really so different. And I, you know, and I love the image of windows and mirrors, but I was talking to somebody once and they said, we should also say that books are doors. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I like that because, you know, you look through a window, but you walk through a door Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that's uh, really important. And the, the other part of your question is, you know, when I was growing up reading, like I said, loved, loved to read, but did not find books about my community that were written for me. I really didn't. The stories I heard that I related to on a cultural level were just told by family stories. They weren't really in books. They were just, you know, they just weren't available. I mean, that said, I I loved books just for the reason I said mentioned earlier, but I also think that it's really important for uh, readers to have books that are culturally relevant to them. I I think it's really important for them to see themselves in books in a, in a very direct way. Oh, here's a story of somebody who uses the words I use, who lives in the city I live, who eats the foods I eat, who has the, the rituals and traditions that I practice, you know, so that gives them, uh, you know, the very true (laughs) idea that their stories are worthy of being told and being read about. And so I've been really a, a big advocate for, you know, cultivating books that are reflective of the communities that, you know, that, that children live in. So that's really, I don't want another child, like a, a personal mission of mine. I don't want another child from Corpus Christi, Texas, or San Antonio, <laughs> Texas, or the Valley to go through their whole education like I did, and including college, without encountering a book written about their homeland and their home culture, you know. <laughs> well, we now now we need to make a t-shirt that says that because <laughs> that yeah. is you have you have like kind of just spoken so beautifully to exactly the reason we have you here and the mission yeah. um, that we have at this podcast. And I'm I'm so happy that, you know, and I think that this is what's so encouraging too is that we are trying really hard inside the classroom to do it, but to see your journey of going from classroom to authorship, what a great way to advocate for students by becoming an author and filling such a massive need. And I think one of the things that made me so excited about the fact that you tackled these folk tales is that the folk tales units exist. Everyone teaches yeah. folk tales. Yep. <laughs> we teach the ones that are in the textbooks, right? Like there's still, and I, and I know Texas is, is, it does a lot of, um, has a lot of struggles, I think with, uh, textbook companies and like what you can and have in your classrooms. Um, a lot of States are kind of going through this kind of up and down tumultuous experience, but I love to say like brave new teaching listeners, like here it is, like here is another folktale that belongs in the new canon, the new, yes, we should teach folktales, but we don't always have access. Like you said, I've tried to look for, like nice clips of, uh, you know, a a retelling of La Llorona or other types of stories. And like, it's hard to find anything online. Marie and I, we we played that beautiful, the musical version. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the name of the young woman who sings a song. Angela Aguilar. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) song, La Llorona, is so beautiful, but it's still not the narrative. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really exciting that you're putting something out there for the community for teachers, for schools to kind of change the future of not just their kids in Texas, but all over. I think it's amazing. And I'm, I'm so excited. Well, and (laughs) as a, as a very, very fledgling, like I understand some Spanish and I can Mm -hmm. speak very little bits having to look words up as I was reading was like fun. I don't know. It's because I'm a nerd, (laughs) right? Like, but I was, it was talk about a window of like, I hear my students speaking in different language. I I do have many students who are Spanish speakers. And so like picking up on, oh, that's what they were saying. Like, (laughs) it's, it's cool. Also with that window aspect, even for me as an educator, like, 
having to like pause for a minute and gain a further layer of understanding of these characters and their interaction. And they're just like camaraderie with each other because of their shared language. It was, I don't, I just really liked this book a lot. Well, I, I like to tell. It, well, it's just so cool. I mean, this is not, we're going to, we, we can change yeah. a question that we had already thought about, but I do think that's something I would love to hear about Diana, like in your experience as a writer, including Spanish and like how much context you want to provide and how much you want to just lay it out there. We're going to be also talking to um, Elizabeth Acevedo very soon, who also mm-hmm. uses Spanish in her in her work, and I just finished in the fall reading Javier Zamora's Solito. He uses a lot of Spanish in his memoir, and it's just so interesting to see authors treating Spanish differently. Because some people I will read, and they just plow right through, like you're on your own. This is it. This is right <laughs> part of the experience, right? Because yeah. people who speak English don't stop to define anything for you. But I feel like you did give a lot of context for your readers. How was that experience for you in the writing and the blending of languages? You know, I'm actually not bilingual, you know, so okay. I grew up here. I grew up in a place where there's a lot of Spanish around, Mm -hmm. Uh, but at a time where it was very discouraged to, uh, I mean, there were no bilingual education programs. Unfortunately, my parents are of the generation that was shamed for their language. And so they, they very purposefully chose to speak only English to us Mm because they thought of it as a language of schooling, you know? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, But you can't escape. You can't, if you live here, you just can't escape hearing my, my grandfather only spoke Spanish, you know, so it's like, I can understand a lot without being able to speak it, but there are words that just that I just hear them. And I just hear the Spanish word. I don't hear the English word just because of where I'm at. And so when I'm writing, there's different things that are going on because you want the voice to sound like the place where the characters exist. I mean, but you don't want to insert Word like oh I'm just going to insert right you know because that just sound that's not how it works you know it's it, gratuitous it, at that point right, right. yeah yeah, yeah. It's, more, it's more natural than that and uh, and so I just kind of let the the Spanish words occur where I'm used to hearing them in my mm-hmm. in my mm-hmm. life uh, and a lot of times it's the older people that are speaking the Spanish but the young kids understand but they're not always speaking it and then just certain you know certain words that. I can't even I can't even tell you which ones right now, but you know, it's just like you just hear the Spanish version, and um, you know, but but I also don't want to lose readers because of the language, and and I want to gather as many readers as I can. So I'm hoping without providing because I also don't like when I read books and they use a Spanish word and then they uh, define it in English, you know, like right next to I don't just really like, like beat that. you over sound, the head with it. You're right. right. Yeah. You're helpful. like, we got yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> the context clues, you can kind of figure out you oh, know, yeah. uh, enough of what's, you might not know the exact meaning of the word, but you can get the gist. And that really is how, um, how I deal with Spanish. I, I wrote a book, it was published in uh, 2018. Uh, and it's, it's a upper elementary book. It's still middle grade, but like upper elementary called Lucky Luna. And uh, my, and I just tackled this language issue straight on. I said, you know what, Luna's going to be like me, you know, where you know she speaks only English, but she has a grandmother who speaks only Spanish, and her grandmother is so wise, <laughs> so she she goes to her grandmother for advice. But when she hears Spanish, she only capture, captures like a few words. She doesn't capture the whole sentence. So she has to like guess like what the rest of the sentence is based on the context and her grandmother's body language. And, you know, and I put some humor. She guesses wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> she guesses the advice wrong. <laughs> but that's very much, a, 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 a you know, I think a lot of students related to that book because that's how they they're, they themselves are dealing with language. <laughs> sure. I love that. All right, Marie, let's, let's, we're, we are asked you a lot of questions, Diana. So we're going to, I know, I don't want to take, keep you here forever, but Marie, what else do you think we should ask Diana before we go? Well, we like to teach, well, we like, when we're talking about teaching, we're talking about curriculum design. We like to do things quite thematically. We teach through inquiry and we teach other teachers how to use like inquiry based curriculum design using essential questions. And so 
aside from the historical context and like the cultural details and windows and and doors, right? And mirrors, what are some themes you think that are like a little bit more general about humanity that you like to explore through your characters and your stories? You know, for me, uh, probably all my books, I'm always exploring family and those familial relationships. I think it's a very, it's a very complex part of our lives, our families. You don't get to choose your families, right? but you know, and so the love you have for your family, you know, and my parents used to say, well, your, your friends are the people, you know, you choose to be with. They used to always say that. And that made me realize, oh, if I don't really like somebody, <laughs> if they're being mean to me, they don't have to be my friend. Uh, but you don't really get that with family. You don't get to choose them. And so uh, there, and and yet you share so much of your life with them that their significance, you know, they have such significance in your life. And so those are very complicated relationships, different family structures, the need for forgiveness, you know, that, that comes with being part of a family, but also, especially for characters, the age of, of the, you know, characters I write about the gradual distancing of yourself from your mm-hmm. family and the, and, and uh, exploring your own independence. I mean, Felice actually runs away. <laughs> yeah, no, she's ballsy. Yeah. She, yeah, she actually she, runs away from yeah. to go on this journey. And, um, you know, and so she's having to, you know, rely on her own uh, skills, her own courage, you know, her own problem solving abilities to, to make things happen. So that gradual independence that you have from your family is something that I think is a theme that it's middle grade for a reason. You're, you're in the middle of childhood and adulthood and everybody's telling you that, you know, to stop being a baby, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but at the same time, they're still putting a lot of strictures on you. And so, you know, how much freedom can you really have? And so uh, I think those are some of those universal things that I love to explore in my books. So I thought of that right away. I thought this would be a beautiful coming of age unit uh-huh. um, mm-hmm. for classes. If you're not going to go the folktale route, I love the coming of age route of the story and Felice's journey. I think it's so beautiful. Yes. Okay. So I do want to ask you one more question before we wrap up and then um, we'll, we'll t- let our listeners know how to find you and all that kind of stuff too. So I think my one thing I want to press you on is this one. If someone were about to embark on teaching one of your novels, what would you encourage her to do with the opportunity? Well, I I would encourage them to visit my website. Uh, I have a classroom page on my website and uh, at the bottom for every book uh, because I was a teacher. (laughs) So it's like, I remember being a teacher and wanting to teach (laughs) a book and there was nothing for me. And sometimes that actually turned me off because I didn't have time to create a resource for myself. It's a lot. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just hard. So all of my books have an educator resource. I, I've written them except believe it or not, I did not write the one for this book <laughs> uh, because I, uh, luckily for me, this book was selected for a grant by a Congressman in Texas, Joaquin Castro, an educator's grant. And so uh, he hired a teacher her name is Araceli Manriquez, and she wrote the educator guide. And what I really love about it, it's a bilingual educator guide. Wow. So to people in, in bilingual education programs can really take advantage of that. The book is also uh, going to be available in Spanish very soon. That's cool. Uh, so I would encourage them to visit my website and take advantage of those educator guides. But also, I love visiting classrooms, and so I, I'm very much available to visit classrooms. And I know we're all over the country, but that is the beauty of um, Zoom. You know, I don't think it's the best way because I, you know, <laughs> I love to be there in person, but that's not always possible. But uh, but these bringing an author into the classroom and having the author chat with the students, even if it's just 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I think is just really eye opening for for the young people, you know, because they they see us as like, oh, we're real, like we do exist. <laughs> you know? We're not, you know, like we're not, we're just like them, and maybe some of them want to be writers, and, yeah. and they can see that. So I would really uh, encourage them to take advantage of that opportunity. Visit my website. You can contact me. I'm very easy to find, 
and would love to, you know, uh, chat in. One thing I I did find over the pandemic years <laughs> when, you know, I wasn't doing in-person classroom visits, I was doing a lot of Zoom visits and I did discover to make it a little more personal, I like to ask the teachers to have the students send me questions in advance mm-hmm. that I can work into my program, you know, and I'll even, I'll even uh, give a shout out to the students who wrote the question and that always makes it a little more special. <laughs> And that's how you can tell that you're a classroom educator, right? Like, (laughs) you know what to expect out of that classroom behavior component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Absolutely. All right. Well, Diana, we have to say thank you so much. We could keep asking you questions all day because, again, we're nerdy English teachers and you are like everything we want to be. You're a nerdy English teacher. Welcome to the club. (laughs) And a writer. Like, how cool is that? (laughs) I love it. Um, So thank you so, so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you. We really appreciate your time. And we do want to say another quick thing, which is that friends, listeners of the podcast, if you are a member of Happy Hour, we are actually going to continue this conversation on an extended episode. We have some good questions for Diana all about education, about uh, a little bit deeper. We want to ask her some more questions about teaching these novels. I am fascinated by the idea of having a teaching guide because... Yes. I think I, I've never really found myself with very decent teaching guides. So I am very excited to look into this. Um, so we've got some more questions for her. Join us in happy hour. But before we go and like really get there, will you tell all of our listeners on the general podcast how they can get in touch with you or just find you in general? Uh, I have a website. It's www.dianalopezbooks.com. Uh, and I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And my handle is at Diana Lopez Books. So it's pretty easy. Uh, you can email me at Diana Lopez Books at yahoo.com. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me. So please, if you have additional questions or, you know, just want to say hi, <laughs> I would love to hear from you. And then they can also set up, you said they can set up a classroom visit through your website as well, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, the best way to do that is just to uh, email me and, uh, you know, and then let, you know, let me know and, and uh, I will write back to you. That's awesome. Yay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. And everybody, make sure that you join us for happy hour because we are going to continue this conversation now. But otherwise, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks again for listening to Brave New Teaching. We'd love to keep the conversation going over on Instagram. And while you're there, check out the links in our bio for the most up-to-date events going on in the Brave New Teaching community. Thanks for being here and have a great week at school.